Good morning. At this point, it might be a simple thing for you to believe that we are now contradicting some of the earlier work in the message of the infinite way. Watch yourself in this direction because there is no contradiction here. There is only a progressive unfoldment into higher steps. For instance, <clears throat> in our earlier experience in metaphysics, regardless of what school we came up through, and including our earlier work in the infinite way, whenever we were faced with discordant appearances, inharmonies, we have been taught to refute that appearance, to reverse it, or to reinterpret it, and uh, to realize that right where it appeared to be, right there is the activity of the Christ. We have been taught the relationship between God and individual being as oneness, and therefore that this is a spiritual universe. And so whenever we came up against an appearance of hate, envy, jealousy, malice, or of accident, or sin, or disease. We have been trained, and rightfully so, let me say that, rightfully so, to immediately dismiss the appearance, disregard it, and uh, realize even if it was only mentally okay realize even if it was only mentally that the law of God was the only law, or the presence of God was the only presence, or the power of God was the only power. In the same way, we have been taught that regardless of the nature of the erroneous appearance, we were quickly to realize that there is no power apart from God, therefore there is no power in this effect, or in this circumstance, or condition, or disease, or belief. And uh, we have been taught that since there is only one substance, there is no such thing as material substance, decaying substance, aging substance. And so, we have been, in all of our experience, applying, mentally, the letter of truth until, through that, what we call treatment, we arrived at the consciousness of truth or experience of truth or realization of truth and then uh, let the realization uh, bring about the restoration of harmony. Now, what we're doing today is not contradicting that. We're going higher than that. Because now in this special work that we're doing, we are assuming that each one of us already knows the basis of the principle of the infinite way, that is, oneness, allness. We are assuming that within ourselves 
we understand full well that we are not using a power of God over a power of error. We are not using truth over error, God over evil, since we have come to the realization of God as one, all, beside which there is no other. Now, with that as the basis and foundation of our consciousness, <coughs> we are taking the next step, which is that of uh, experience, God experience or spiritual experience. Now, of course, it requires no words and no thoughts for a spiritual experience, and words and thoughts would only be a detriment. Remember that I said yesterday that I do not know yet whether it is going to be possible for this work to succeed. I don't know if it's ever having been tried before. <clears throat> for this reason, those who have uh, through some divine grace, through some power uh, for which they personally were not responsible and for which there's no credit due them, have received some measure of inner light, already know what the spiritual experience is, and that spiritual experience is uh, the governing factor in their experience. <clears throat> now, the Master was enabled to open the consciousness of his disciples <clears throat> to some measure of this experience. Not to too great a degree of it, as you know by the results of their work. <clears throat> but at least to such a degree that after his departure from the human scene, when they were thrown completely on their own resources, at least a few of them did attain a tremendous measure, particularly Peter, Matthew, possibly John, if this great John was the John who was a disciple. Christ is an experience, but if you try to state truth, you miss the mark. Even in teaching and in treating with the letter of truth, there must be the recognition that the mental activity of imparting and the mental activity of hearing is not the spiritual experience. Even a teacher must recognize that the words they speak with their lips does not constitute the power of God, nor does it uh, include, nor does it embrace spiritual teaching. The spiritual teaching is done by the state of consciousness behind the speech, behind the voicing of truth, behind the uttering of truth. It is like writing these letters to patients and students all over the world as if the print or the words in certain uh, sequence were going to benefit or bless anybody. That isn't true at all. If it were true, we could just hire a staff of people to sit down and answer those letters. But it wouldn't work. It is the consciousness of the writer, the consciousness of the one who dictates or writes, and again it is the consciousness of the one who types, that determines whether or not there is healing power in the message that is written. Just as in the books that are printed, just that following a certain sequence of words into sentences and paragraphs does not constitute a spiritual message and there is no book 
ever written, including the Holy Bible, which in and of itself could ever be a spiritual message. But the consciousness of the one who brought forth the message is whatever power lies in scripture or in metaphysics. If to that could be added printers and bookbinders, typists, secretaries, also of spiritual consciousness, then the books would be so alive that they'd be tingling all over the bookshelves and wouldn't be able to stand still. Just as sometimes you may receive a letter in the mail and it'll almost burn your fingers because of the power of the consciousness behind uh, that work. Now, always it is the power of the consciousness of the individual that determines the outcome of teaching, healing, regenerating, saving or reforming or enriching or prospering. Always it is the consciousness of the individual. That consciousness may be at a tremendous degree of illumination such as Buddha or Jesus or John of the Gospel of John or it may be a lesser state of consciousness like the other disciples or apostles. It may be a tremendous illumined force and power through some individuals, much lesser degree through others. That is a matter over which no one has control. That is a matter of divine grace. The only control that we have is in the degree of our seeking and striving for that consciousness. Whether or not we achieve it is not up to us. Some will seek and strive until they wear themselves out and will not attain it. Others will just treat it very lightly and uh, take it easily and steadily and uh, spontaneously bust out all over with the springtime of the Christ consciousness. The experience of Christ is one that is achieved purely through uh, grace. It is a gift of God and in whatever degree it comes it is a gift of God. It does not come because we earn it. It does not come because we deserve it. It does not come primarily because we may be good men or women. It is much more apt to come to some pretty bad ones because their inner struggle is greater than the struggle of the good ones. And that struggle is often highly rewarded. The only responsibility that we have is that our desire be for it and that our willingness to experience it be shown forth by the degree of our studies and meditations. That's only, that is the only part that our uh, responsibility goes. The achieving of it is purely the gift of God, purely the Christ. And no one earns it, no one deserves it, and no one knows why it comes to some and doesn't come to others. Now, we do know that I, if I be lifted up, shall draw men unto me. We do know that in proportion as any individual receives spiritual light, that light can become a law unto those who come to them. In other words, everyone who has ever brought about a healing through metaphysical work has been the light unto that one. And it was the light in their consciousness that brought the healing to the other. Now, there isn't a practitioner who has success in healing. There isn't a teacher who has success in healing that hasn't some measure of spiritual light or they wouldn't be successful in it. If they have uh, success, it means 
that their state of consciousness becomes the law of harmony unto their patients or students' state of consciousness. Then this means that whatever degree of light you achieve automatically makes you, in that degree, a light to all those who touch your consciousness. Now that is the purpose of the work, this special work, that we're doing right now, so that each one of us here may attain a higher degree of that light through the experience itself. Now, I am assuming that you are reading the writings and that insofar as is possible you are hearing recordings. In other words, at least exposing yourselves to whatever spiritual light has come to us through the message of the infinite way. In that way then, I am sure that you are having the correct letter of truth. You will not be misled within yourselves. Now, with that as an assumption, our work in this room now is leaving that behind, or rather leaving it to you to fill yourselves with outside so that we can take our time here toward an actual experience itself. That's the point of our work. And so, if I say to you now, the first difficulty you will experience in ceasing from the old form of prayer or treatment is when you begin to observe discords, inharmonies out in the world because your first reaction will be to return to the way in which we have originally been taught that of denying the error and knowing the truth. But now I would like you to take an entirely different approach and see what happens. Take specific note of what happens as you follow this approach. Now, the basis of the new approach is this. No activity of thought is a healing influence. Therefore, no matter what I know with my mind is not going to heal anybody or help anybody or save anybody or bless anybody. And so, as I observe discords and inharmonies in the world, I am going to not take thought. I am going to stop and uh, have no opinion, no judgment. I am going to make no statement of either denial or of affirmation. I am not going to let the human mind into this picture. I'm neither going to say it is no part of God, nor am I going to say the only activity is God. I'm going to put the finger on my lips. If I must declare something or think something, it will be something like, Thy grace is my sufficiency. Yes, we can fill out the word with just some statement like that. <coughs> something that is not pertinent to what we are seeing, observing. If it is pertinent to that, we have entered the argument. We have uh, come into combat with the appearance. We have engaged in battle. We are going to stand aside and not enter the human scene. We are going to stand aside without any judgment as to whether this is of the devil or whether it's of God. As if it made any difference, really, what I thought about it. Now, don't look on this as a contradiction. 
Our early experiences were the preparation for this. We prepared ourselves for this by building up a consciousness that did not accept appearances at their face value, but always reinterpreted them. Now, we are going to disengage ourselves from the world of appearances. Let me show you the principle behind that. <clears throat> Every time you engage in denial or affirmation, you are in the world of either good or evil. You are in the world of appearances or the world of the pairs of opposites, which is the human world. And so even if you change a discord into a harmony, you have merely changed one human appearance for another human appearance. It is very much as if you had a person who was stone broke and by your knowing the truth or some other mental abacadabra could all of a sudden uh, produce a hundred dollars for them. Now what do you do with them next week or next month? Walk around and follow them for the rest of their lives producing hundred dollar bills for them? No. You see that even uh, if you had a person who was dying of illness and uh, by your knowing the truth or any other mental activity could uh, bring health to them, that you'd have to follow them around the rest of their lives, turning their ills into health. Because always there will be these pairs of opposites in the human pictures. And eventually you'd be called upon to change age into youth. Now, in this approach, you are no longer either a medical doctor, changing sickness into health, nor are you a metaphysician, turning a discordant human condition into a harmonious human appearance. You are revealing Christhood because Christhood is the true identity of every individual on the face of the globe. Man, woman, child, animal, vegetable, or mineral. Christ is their true identity. Christ meaning spiritual being, spiritual nature and character, spiritual entity and identity. The Son of God, Emmanuel. Now, in our earlier days, it was a wonderful experience to see sickness turned into health, lack turned into abundance. To those of us who have had years of that, the sad part was to see the sick, the well become sick again, or the, uh, those who had demonstrated abundance go back to their old poverties again. The Bible has something to say about returning to one's vomit. In other words, we return to the positions we have outgrown because we haven't outgrown the state of consciousness that produced it. The Master, when he says, neither do I condemn thee, also says, but go and sin no more. And how can a person who is of the sinful consciousness, how can they sin no more? They can't prevent sinning any more than the person who has a poverty complex can prevent going back to poverty. Or the person who has a disease complex going back to disease. There's no way except one. Be ye therefore trans renewed by the transforming of your mind, by the transforming of consciousness. When the Christ is admitted into individual spiritual consciousness, it of its own accord eliminates sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation by being the mind that was in Christ Jesus and being the mind of the individual. When the mind that is in Christ Jesus is uh, our individual mind, 
we have no possibility of going back to any place but Christhood. But as long as we are left with the same old human mind with which we've grown up, we must return to its consequences. There is no way to avoid that. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. And if you continue to have that fleshly mind, it must produce carnal experiences. It is a law. Can we rise above the law? Only one way. And that is, by grace, we come into the experience of that mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, which is not a thinking mind or a reasoning mind. Since it says we do not live by bread alone, which is a very foolish statement, it also says, I have meat ye know not of, and he didn't have any meat that we know not of, at least we couldn't see any around him. And uh, he also said, I am uh, the bread. And I am the water. All of which are very foolish statements, as you know. Certainly, judging by human standards, or by the human sense of language, those are foolish statements. But, spiritually, they are true. And everyone who has attained uh, even the tiniest degree of spiritual light knows what the Master means when he says, I have meat the world knows not of. Now, that is one of those statements that can fill consciousness whenever you face a discord, an inharmony, whether in yourself or whether in others. I have a meat the world knows nothing of. say, well, what does that mean? What has that got to do with this situation? Well, that, that must reveal itself within you. At least it's keeping you from arguing with the world of appearances. At least it's keeping you out of a battle with a ghost that has no entity or identity or substance or form or law. There is a tremendous spiritual power if you can only fill your consciousness with the Christ message of I. I am the bread of life. Whatever that will mean to you, I don't know at this moment. But if I were looking out at some discordant appearance, it would mean to me that the I, the Christ of God, has all the substance and law necessary to meet any experience. That's what it would mean to me. I have meat the world knows that of. I have a power. I have a presence. I have a state of consciousness that the world knows nothing about, but it heals the sick, raises the dead, preaches the gospel to the poor, opens the eyes of the blind. Now, never enter the world of argument with any discord or in harmony, if possible, turn from it without any thought, or if necessary, to occupy your thought, your mind for the moment with thought, let it be with a Christ realization, even though it will have no application to the picture that is before you. I remember a healing that took place many years ago came out of the clear blue sky when I was standing in the presence of a man ill and given up for dying. And the only thing that came into my mind was, man does not live by bread alone. I had no more application to the scene that I was witnessing than anything you can imagine. But the healing was instantaneous. So instantaneous that the man who was lying under an oxygen tent turned his head, motioned for the nurse, and said, take it away, I don't need it, and didn't need it. And a few days later was out of the hospital. You say, 
Well, you had no part in that. I'll admit that. Because I didn't think those, that thought consciously. That was something that popped into my head. And uh, I know what its application was. Under the oxygen tent, he was living by breath, by air. But man doesn't live by air alone. He lives by the grace of God. Of course, had I just made that up at that moment to fit the case, that healing would not have taken place. And that's why I say, don't search around in your thought for some thought that will be applicable because you'll miss the mark. The further you can get from any statement that applies to the situation, the better off you will be and your patient and your own experience. Now let us see. <clears throat> Does anyone in this room actually believe that all the twenty odd books of the message of the infinite way strung end to end will heal anybody of a headache? No. Well, will it uh, do any better if we recite it? Will it do any better if we think it? And what good is it? <clears throat> the only good they are is that they have brought us to this state of consciousness where we can now no longer rely on them but the state of consciousness out of which they came. And that state of consciousness is Christ. They never came out of a man's consciousness any more than you would like to give credit to the pen or the typewriter. Neither can you give credit to the man. They come out of Christ consciousness. Do you see that? And uh, that truth, the truth embodied in those books, not only has brought us, but will keep us on this level of consciousness to where gradually we will use less and less of the letter of truth and receive more and more of direct spiritual unfoldment from within. Sometimes people don't stop to realize that it isn't right that Don Blanding should get all the royalties on all of his books and we pay for them by reading them instead of us writing them and getting royalties for ourselves or at least saving us from having to buy the books. I know some of our people feel that way about my books. There's no reason why they should buy them when they could write them. But then, you know, as a matter of actual fact. There's no greater experience in the world than that we share these unfolding ideas and uh, uh, reward those who bring them forth. But the point that I really am serious about is that there isn't anybody in the world that can't write their own books, especially truth books, because there comes a moment of transition to everybody where you don't take in where it pours out. Oh yes, there must be years and years and years in our experience of uh, taking in the great wisdom of all of the masters and probably throughout our entire human span we will continue to draw inspiration from them. There isn't a day of the week that I'm not reading somebody's books here, mostly ancient ones, because of the inspiration that I draw from them and the joy that I get in seeing how universal truth is and how they were stealing my stuff thousands of years ago. <laughs> Some of you know that we caught a fellow here plagiarizing from the infinite way in the year 1100. Word for word he had it. A whole paragraph. But we won't sue him. Now, the point that I'm making is this. In being aware of the discords of human existence, instead of drawing on this for your denials and affirmations, instead of drawing on your head, on your thinking, on your memorizing of truth, now stand stock still and let the Father give you 
the necessary truth for the situation. Because that is the way I have to do when I'm called upon for help. I can't turn to a single soul or any memorized statements from my writings. Because if I thought they had power, I just let them do the work. No, I never go back to draw from anything in my writings or anybody else's writings or even from scripture. When I am called upon for help, I sit down in an atmosphere of expectancy, if I have to sit down. Sometimes I'm walking or out here under the trees. Sometimes it's while I'm at table eating. But I am so in a receptive uh, state of consciousness that regardless of what presents itself to me, I wait for the Father to give me the answer. I don't rush into speech. I don't rush into answering the letters in my desk. I read them. And then when I sit down, I listen. And if the answer isn't there, I put the letter aside until later that day or that night or tomorrow. But when I answer a letter, it has to be the Father answering. And so it is. When I am asked personally for help, you, you all notice my attitude. It's always one of listening, and then, if I have anything to say, saying it. Now that is to bring you to the point of experiencing the Christ. You experience the Christ every time a discord or inharmony appears to you, and instead of you making a statement of truth, or thinking a thought of truth, you just turn within and wait until uh, some truth comes to you. It doesn't have to come in words. It doesn't have to come in thoughts. Eventually you'll find that it comes in just a feeling of release, and you know all is well. That is the experience of the Christ. That is the point that I am trying now to see if all of us cannot embody The method, do not engage in controversy with any form of error. Stand still. If you must think a thought, at least think something that has no bearing on it. Something like, divine grace is sufficient. My Father knoweth what things we have need of. I have meat the world knows that Christ has meat. The Christ is meat, but the world knows not of. Anything like that will do. We do not live by bread alone. Anything like that will keep thought occupied so that your thought isn't directly meeting or responding to or refuting the problem. Do you see that? That gives the Christ an opportunity to come to you in experience. Later on, you will follow this same method with all of the harmonies. Because once you have achieved the slightest degree of success in this, in meeting discords, the next thing that will present itself to you is this. If you look at a 12 or 15 year old child and think how beautiful, how sweet, how innocent, how nice, your thought will rush ahead a little to 10 years from now, or 20, or 50, and you'll say, uh-oh, this is just a temporary good. This pure, innocent, sweet, clean, healthy child is going to be a doddering old woman. Or a sinful so-and-so. Do you see what I'm getting at? Because you know right well that the human good of this moment won't remain. And so you will learn to follow this same practice when you see youth, health, vitality, wealth. You learn to look right through it and not rejoice in it, but clear your thought in the same spiritual way so that the Christ can show you the truth about what even appears as 
human good. Just as you want Christ to reveal the truth about a discord and an inharmony, you had better want Christ to reveal the truth about a good human appearance or it's only a question of time when it's going to change to a bad human appearance. The nature of all human good is to become evil, isn't it? Youth becomes age, health becomes sickness, strength becomes weakness, abundance becomes lack, so forth and so on, until finally life becomes death. Uh, that's the history of the human world. By first training ourselves with these evidences or appearances of discord and inharmonies, to close our mind to that picture and permit the Christ to reveal the true nature of being, we then prepare ourselves for the next step, which is to look out at our beautiful trees and our beautiful plants and our beautiful animals and our wonderful youth and be able to not think good thoughts about them but wait patiently for the Christ to reveal the truth about them. What good is there in all the world about these sweet young kids if we have to watch them grow up into what we have witnessed past generations grow up into? Only in so far. You know, one generation after another has called the past generation doddering and old and, and ignorant and so forth, and they have deserved it. But the point is that it's always going to be the same way until a generation comes along anchored in Christ. A generation that no longer thinks humanly, feels humanly, lives humanly, but begins to live in their and through their Christhood. There'll never be such a generation unless, as in the case of Jesus Christ, there is one individual to start it. And it never will go far unless there are found twelve ready to carry it on and impart it. And even then it won't be too far reaching unless there are seventy and two hundred. Then uh, we can embark on the way. Now, There is no literature in all of the world, ancient or modern, that reveals this truth. There is none. Search for it and see if you can find it. There is no literature, ancient or modern, that reveals the way to attain Christhood. There are those who achieved it by grace, there are none who have been able to impart it. And the reason, up to this moment, there has been no way found of imparting it. At least none that has ever worked. It has been imparted to the twelve, and out of the twelve, three or four made some headway with it. It was imparted to several by Buddha, but only two received it. It was imparted to many by Lao Tzu. Only one was able to carry on. At no period in the world's history has it been able to impart it to a group so that a group could uh, attain it and maintain it. Now, I firmly believe that because we have the correct letter of truth in the writings to practice, to remember, to draw upon, to use, that through it we can achieve a sufficient degree of Christ consciousness so that we can go out and practice this that we are being given today. Is it clear to you that a man isn't trying to do this today? Is it clear to you that this work has been going on for eight years? Nine years, maybe? Oh, nine years, yes. I guess going on ten, isn't it, Ann? Going on ten years, this work. And yet, this is the first time these words have been voiced. 
so that those ten years have been a preparation uh, for this? Now, It is a wonderful thing the strides the world has made in metaphysics. It's a wonderful thing the, the strides that many religious teachings are making in coming to this awareness. But somewhere, somehow, some group have to be in the world with their fingers on their lips for a long time. Not telling this, not teaching this, demonstrating it achieving more of the measure of that mind which was in Christ Jesus, so that by their fruits they shall be known. Not by talk, not by promises, by their fruits. Now, I wouldn't want to go out before a big audience and say these things, not because they aren't true, but because the answer would be, so what? How can a person achieve the demonstration of this who hasn't arrived at that point where automatically they have attained the consciousness that knows the unreality of evil and won't run around trying to be sympathetic to somebody in their sins or their diseases or their lacks or their limitations, but is willing to sit within their own being realizing Christhood and let Christ raise them up. If I could enrich every member, every student in this room or every student of the infinite way, would I be doing anything for them? No. The opportunity was given us last year in television and radio where dozens of our students would have become rich through the demand that was made for help. What benefit would that have been to them unless they had achieved it through Christ, not just through my getting a television show. Do you see that? If I could give health to everybody in the hospital, what benefit would I be giving them if I wasn't able to give them Christhood? Do you see that? That is the point that we are at now. I have loved my work for 25 years, bringing some measure of health, some measure of supply, some measure of peace, to many, many, many people, and now through the writings and recordings to thousands of people. But it isn't enough. It isn't enough. Nothing is enough until through the activity of the Christ in human experience we can change and transform human experience. It isn't enough for a Jesus to heal multitudes, and it isn't enough for a Joel to heal more multitudes. There must be an activity of Christ bringing about these healings so that we won't need the Jesus or the Joels or the Mary Baker Eddies or the Myrtle Fillmores or any of those noble souls who in the past have led up by their work, their consciousness, their activity to this moment. Unless this world is full of the presence of the Christ, it will always be the same old story each generation raising up a prophet to tell the story again and then the story dying out and waiting for a new prophet to come in the new age and still the answer is we do not even know if there be a Christ. And that is the answer of the world today. We do not know if there be a Christ because there is no evidence except an individual experience here or there but an activity of Christ in human experience whereby everyone can reach out to this Christ, it hasn't yet happened. Now, if it happens, it will be through a large enough demonstration of the activity of the Christ in human experience. In other words, when by our example we can attain that mind or some measure of that mind which was in Christ Jesus and watch the world benefit from it, not from our personal activity, from it. Then will we have something to show forth to the world. If we in our experience can bring the activity of the Christ into the courtrooms where the battles are or into the activities of the unions and the corporations, 
if we can bring the activity of the Christ to bear in the business world, then you see the world can say, well, at least we have had evidence that there be a Christ. Now let us see some evidence that we ourselves can benefit, achieve Christhood. Now, the first difficulty is going to appear as you behold evidences of sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation and are tempted to do something about it. First humanly and then through right thinking. And the first temptation is going to be resist the temptation to do right thinking. Find some statement of the masters to fill your thought so that you do not refute the appearance before you or enter into controversy or argument with it. Stand aside and realize I am the way, the truth, and the life. You say that's meaningless. Good. The more meaningless it is, so let it be. Because we do not want through the power of thought or reason to meet a situation, but through the Christ. Remember that statement, we do not wish even through reason to meet a case, but through Christ. The Christ which passeth human understanding. Why is that in Scripture? The peace that passeth human understanding. The peace that no human being can reason out, think out, or will, or desire, or find a way to achieve. Only Christ can bring about. And what is Christ? Christ is the activity that takes place in your consciousness when no thinking is going on. Christ is the activity that takes place within you when no personal effort is going on. When you're not trying to heal, when you're not trying to improve, when you're not trying to reform, when you're not trying to make a change, when you're standing still in your Christhood, then the activity of Christ comes into expression. Do you see that? The Christ is hidden when you're taking thought for your life or your patient's life or your student's life. The activity of the Christ is not present when you're thinking through a problem. When you can come to that point of absolute humility where Jesus found himself when he said I can of my own self do nothing. When you come to that point of absolute humility you'll stand still in thought with your ear wide open your inner ear waiting and giving God the opportunity to come out into expression. Then is when Christ will have the opportunity to fulfill itself in experience. In India, they have a habit. Whenever a new home is opened or a new public building, and in some cases, new business enterprises, they will have their swamis or holy men go into that place in what we would call today to bless it. In the orthodox way, that would mean to sort of say a prayer and hope that God will come in and be kind and good to it. Actually, as they understand it and as it understood in our work here, The moment we come into any place with complete silencing of human thought or wish or will and wait until the activity of the Christ touches our consciousness, then the room is full of the presence of Christ. Then and then only. There are no prayers that will do that. There are no words and there are no thoughts. There must be a complete silencing of the human will, of the human desire, so that the activity of the Christ can penetrate the atmosphere and fill all space. Then it remains for those who are in that home or that business or that public building to so conduct their affairs as to represent 
so far as they are concerned, their highest sense of spiritual harmonious good. There is no other way. So it is with healing. There is a way to bring health, harmony, comfort, peace, in some degree, into every sick room in which we go, into every prison cell. And that way is not the way of thinking, that way is not of speaking, or of carrying any message of words or thought. That way is the ability to be there with a sitting, standing, walking, talking, with an area of consciousness open here so that the Christ itself can come into expression. I can assure you, you can only keep it out by speech and thought. All the recitation of these nice metaphysical statements, even scriptural promises, they are hindrances to the activity of the Christ unless they come forth spontaneously as the activity of the Christ, as they did as I stood at that man's bed in the hospital and standing there in receptivity. Then the voice itself shot through, man does not live by bread alone. Do you see that? It wasn't necessary for those words to come thought. The consciousness had come through anyhow, even without words. Now, we can heal wherever there's a receptive consciousness. We can reform, we can redeem, we can renew, we can regenerate, we can enrich wherever there is a receptive consciousness, but only in one way. Now that you know the truth of being, now that you have the letter of truth and you have it to keep reminding yourself of and live in, when you're actually living about your business all the rest of the day, don't think thoughts. Keep yourself receptive to an inflow of thoughts so that it breaks through into your consciousness. Thereby, you have the experience of the Christ. So that, as you go about your day's work, as you go about anywhere where you become conscious of the presence of discord and inharmony, instead of stating truth, resist the temptation to state truth, inwardly hear and let this come through. And this will be an experience of the Christ, and it will go before you to make the crooked places straight. It will bless all those within range of your consciousness, but you won't. It will. Your part will be attaining it. Now, Eventually, as I said, you will go through the same procedure when you witness the harmonies of life, when you witness a beautiful sunset. You will turn also and open a way for the Christ experience to come so that you can rightly see the sunrise or sunset as it is, or the mountain scene. This will ultimate in the activity of the Christ being a constant experience, one not achieved, one not attained at certain moments of the day or night. It will be a constant state of being, so that at any time necessary, it is only necessary to blink the eye and uh, the activity uh, will consciously be realized. But it isn't necessary that that be done. The time eventually comes, I call that in all of the writings, a point of transition, where you pass from living your own life to having your life lived for you and through you, where you become nothing more than an instrument for this divine experience. And you go where you're sent and when you're sent, you have no will of your own, no wish of your own, no desire of your own. You never have supply of your own, and you never even have health. It is always an it 
that is living its own life and uh, we go along for the ride. Now, the achieving of that state of consciousness begins uh, in this particular way. First, because the discords and inharmonies of existence are the most irritating to us and therefore announce themselves more forcefully to us. And so it is that in those moments we will now train ourselves to resist the temptation to deny or affirm or to think thoughts, even good ones, but will give an opportunity for the Christ to announce itself in us and through us. And if necessary, to engage our minds while waiting for it, we will take any one of the Christ messages, those that begin with the word I, or that have some uh, uh, such significance as the I or God. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Thy grace is my sufficiency. The Lord God in the midst of me is mighty. Anything, anything that reveals uh, our awareness of the fact that there be a Christ and that if we give an opportunity it will come into expression. Our stating truth and thinking truth does not bring it. Our refraining from the statement of truth and thinking truth brings it. As long as behind it we have this inner consciousness of the correct letter of truth. Well, that must be it, I guess, because the tape's all used up. <laughs>